Real Virginia is produced by the Virginia Farm Bureau. Farming, it's all good. Visit our website at vafarmbureau.org. Chesapeake Bay, Atlantic to Appalachia, home in my heart always. Hello everyone and welcome to Real Virginia, a show about Virginia agriculture and the people who produce all of the wonderful products we enjoy. The recent diplomatic thaw in relations between the U.S. and Cuba may mean increased Virginia farm exports. Mark Viet says there are all kinds of tree bark to make your garden look interesting this winter, and Virginia's oyster industry is on the rebound, thanks in part to farm-raised oysters. Welcome back, everyone, to Real Virginia. We're here on the banks of the Potomac River, where we're going to talk a little bit about oyster production in Virginia later on in our show. But first, we're talking trade, and trade is critically important to the agriculture industry. The American Farm Bureau is supporting President Obama's move to normalize relations with Cuba in hopes that we can increase our agricultural trade to that country. The Farm Bureau has long believed that expanding trade between the United States and Cuba can serve as a cornerstone for additional reforms. AFBF President Bob Stallman noted that U.S. farmers currently can export goods to Cuba, but third-party banking requirements and limited credit financing make it harder to compete in the market than it should be. We look forward to a prompt lifting of those restrictions. Improving trade relations between the United States and Cuba will expand access to a market of 11 million consumers for U.S. agriculture. That's good for Cuba and good for America, too. Meanwhile, Virginia has been a supplier of agricultural goods to Cuba since 2003, 42 years after U.S. exports were banned. The Old Dominion is among the top four states already sending farm products to Cuba, along with Louisiana, Florida, and Georgia. Under the current circumstances, it's still very limited. The good news is that we have the potential to expand that trade as long as the proper regulations are written and, and approved because uh, uh, we have a, a market that is in, uh, expanding in Cuba. We have uh, businesses like uh, travel or tourism that are uh, quite rela related to agricultural approach that are expanding in Cuba. Then we do have the potential. We only have to change the, the way we do business these days. Dr. Jose Ramon Cabanas Rodriguez, chief of the Cuban Interest Section in Washington, traveled to Richmond to speak with agricultural and political leaders. Thanks to our past sales, he says, Virginia is in a favorable position as the two countries begin considering a post-embargo future. Well, if we are able to uh, remove the obstacles uh, we, we have today, I would say the, the limit will be the sky, you know, because our, our market is expanding. The role of Cuba in the, the Caribbean and, and Latin American economies is increasing. As long as we are able to remove the, remove the obstacles we have these days, and as, as long as we are able to get closer the producers and the people related with trade, uh, I don't see any, any limit in that expansion in, the, in any period of time, 10 or 20 or 30 years. Shortly after the Obama administration announced more liberal relations with Cuba, the Farm Bureau joined more than 25 U.S. food and agriculture companies and organizations to announce the U.S. Agriculture Coalition for Cuba. The coalition seeks the end of the U.S. embargo on Cuba and the advancement of trade relations. I would add that, that we are in a very special moment uh, to discuss how we can interrelate to each other. And I would say that I'm visiting uh, Virginia and, and, and visiting Richmond, uh, an official uh, visit at the right moment. After this many years, uh, a lot of officials from Virginia and related to uh, Farm uh, Bureau and, and producers has been visiting Cuba and attending uh, trade fairs. And now as we understand that we can, could have a different uh, future bi bilaterally. I think that this, is, this visit is relevant and is important in, in that uh, scenario. Rodriguez holds out hope that as trade relations blossom between the U.S. and Cuba, 
More Cuban agricultural products can also be shipped to America and Virginia, helping to boost the Cuban farm economy as well. Virginia farmers have been shipping products to Cuba for more than a decade, despite the difficulty of doing so. The top farm exports right now are soybeans, poultry, and apples. Exports peaked at $60 million two years ago, but dropped to $40 million last year due to Cuba's weakened economy. The American Farm Bureau estimates Cuba buys $350 million worth of rice, corn, soybeans, and frozen chicken parts from American farmers. As for the apples, they are popular products in Cuba's tropical climate, but Virginia's principal grower hasn't sold apples to Cuba for three years as the Caribbean nation sought out less expensive fruit. I'm Mark Viette. Coming up on In the Garden, we're going to talk about bark on trees. Stay with us. Well, they're on our farm here in Virginia in Augusta County. We have been here since 1954. We moved here, my dad did. And since then, I've had my two sons and daughter and son-in-law, they're here. I've got grandchildren, so it's a fourth generation here that's on this farm right now. We really feel blessed that all of our family is a part of this farm. They could have chosen different routes. Well, it's a wonderful place to grow up and have a family, and it's, it's, we can all work together and play together. I know there's a lot of families you now that go to work and you don't see them until that night, whereas with the farm here, we see each other all day long. It's a wonderful place to grow up and live. Being out here in nature and, and watching things grow and, and just days like today that's a beautiful day, you, you just feel very fortunate. I'm Dan Holsinger. I'm dedicated to dairy. My cows, my milk, and my land. Well, it's winter time and there's really nothing to look at in your garden, right? Well, Mark Viet says not so fast. Not if you plant the right trees in the garden. To create interest during the winter when all the leaves are gone, you really want to have something in a garden that brightens up the garden or shows off something different. And in this case, you can choose trees that have a specific exfoliating bark that is beautiful in the winter and even attractive during the summer months. This is one of the Chinese dogwoods. And behind me, I have one of our native dogwoods. Really doesn't have what I call interesting bark, but this bark on this tree starts to shed and you can even peel it off just like this. And every place where I'm peeling off this bark, it's lightly colored. And throughout the season, some of these portions become really lightly colored. I'll show you some things later that sort of look like a giraffe's neck. Many of us are familiar with cherries. Cherries have beautiful bark, could be quite shiny when they're younger. But remember these words, tree, lilac. Right in here we have planted a few of these easy to grow yellow blooming trees. They bloom sometime in June and it's known as the Japanese tree lilac. And look at the bark. You know, to me it would seem that this is the cherry tree until I look up towards the top or see it blooming with yellow flowers just like your lilacs end of May or June. One of my top five favorite small trees with beautiful exfoliating bark is the crepe myrtle. And just imagine a giraffe's neck. And this is a, a small tree that does not get too large in diameter. And if you look, you can see the alternating colors, the cinnamon and the pale, almost whitish color. And you can actually see, and this is kind of neat, the way this bark just peels right off the tree. Here is some of the bark that still was at the base of the tree. In addition to this bark that peeled off this year, this new bark is really smooth. It's almost velvety. Just imagine you're somewhere in the tropics. So you might want to consider planting three or four or five of these in your garden. And the one thing you want to look for is the variety that is called Natchez. It's a pure white flower, maybe not as pretty as the pinks and the reds, but it does have the best exfoliating bark. 
I'm Mark Viet. Join me next time in the garden. For more garden tips, go to inthegardenradio.com. There's one kitchen tool your grandmother could not imagine doing without. We'll show you what that is next in the heart of the home. Horses, dogs, food, and fun. It's all coming March 27th to the 29th at the Virginia Horse Festival at the Meadow. Experience three days of equestrian and family-friendly activities. Shop vendors selling trailers, boots, barns, and food. Watch the Central Virginia Agility Club show off their canines' expertise. Attend clinics, demonstrations, and seminars. Cheer on the Extreme Mustang Makeover East Coast Finals. And don't miss the Parade of Breeds. Learn more at virginiahorsefestival.com. It's the Virginia Horse Festival at Meadow Event Park. Don't miss it. Really? Buzz, what's up, man? You left some leaves burning out here. Yeah, I, I just, I, there was a, I had, just came in just for a second. Come on, man. If it's too hot to touch, it's too hot to leave. You could torch the whole neighborhood. It's a good point there, smoke. Key. Nine out of ten wildfires are caused by humans. Only you can prevent wildfires. Virginia's salt-cured hams are a delicacy all over the world, and the pork industry has a proud tradition dating back to the 1600s in the Old Dominion. There are approximately 919 hog farms in Virginia with 240,000 animals. About 884 of those farms are independent operations with herds as small as a few animals up to 100 head. 35 farms are larger operations with several hundred animals or more. Those hogs typically are raised under contract for a processing firm. Any way you cook it, pork is important to the Old Dominion. With just under $70 million in sales, the hog industry is the 10th most valuable farm sector in Virginia. Chefs have been using iron skillets in their kitchens for generations, but do you know how to use an iron skillet in your kitchen and how you care for it properly? Well, Carissa Jackson does, and she's here to show us a recipe and tips on caring for your iron skillet in the heart of the home. Hi, I'm Carissa Jackson for Heart of the Home, and I'm coming to you from the kitchen at the Meadow Event Park. Today, we're going to make southern fried pork chops in a cast iron skillet. One of the awesome things about cast iron skillets is that in my family, they've been passed down from generation to generation. Unfortunately, I don't have the one that was passed down to me because mine caught on fire. That's how much we used to cook with it. But one of the awesome things about a cast iron skillet is learning how to season it and what that really means. A lot of times we feel like you need to season a cast iron skillet. Well, does that mean you throw salt and pepper in it? No. Um, so the first thing you want to do is for the very first and last time is wash your pot out with some soap and water. You never want to do that again after that first time because some of the most awesome flavor sticks and stays in this skillet, skillet as you continue to cook with it. Then you want to um, line it with a little bit of vegetable oil or whatever shortening that you use to cook with. You want to place it upside down in a preheat, preheated oven at about 400 degrees. You also want to make sure you put some aluminum foil or catch pan at the bottom of your stove to catch any of the drippings that might come down. Bake it for about 20 to 30 minutes and then you're ready to go. What that creates is the ability for it to not stick if you ever do a recipe that doesn't involve um, deep oil like we're going to do to deep fry the pork chops. Um, and it also creates a great flavor sticking quality when it's time for you to start seasoning up those foods. And one of the reasons we don't want to ever wash out our iron skillet again is like I said, those seasonings that continue to um, seep into your food as you cook year after year. Uh, or day after day with it. So the first thing that we're gonna start off with is some fresh clean pork chops and pork is one of the number one commodities in the state of Virginia so you can always find some fresh pork chops um, anytime you go to the supermarket, sometimes to your local butcher as well. Here we have two cups of flour. If you're trying to take the more healthy route, but I don't know why you would do that in the winter time when you're allowed to pack on the pounds, you can use some whole wheat flour if you choose to. We have two cups of regular flour, and we have about a half cup of breadcrumbs. I like to use seasoned breadcrumbs because then that cuts out on the amount of seasoning that I actually have to do to the meat and to the flour. Here we have uh, one tablespoon of savory seasoning, one tablespoon of garlic salt, and one tablespoon of oregano. And we'll just use a whisk. Meanwhile, my cast iron skillet has been warming up 
on medium high heat. A good way to test to know if your oil is ready is either you'll start to see it bubbling up or if you want, you can take a little bit of water from the sink and put it um, into the pan just to see if it starts to bubble. If it starts to bubble, then you know you're ready to go. I'm also gonna use a little bit of salt and pepper just to season my pork chops, but you can season this with anything you like. If you like seasonal, you can do that. Some people like allspice. Poultry season, anything you like. All right. Then we're gonna take our pork chops and we're gonna coat them in the flour. Some people prefer to do a milk and egg wash. If you would like to do that, then you would just need one egg, about a fourth cup of milk. You would whisk it um, inside of a bowl and you would go ahead and dip your pork chops at that point into the milk wash first, then into the flour and then into the pan. Same thing can happen if you're doing fried chicken or fried fish. All of which are incredibly good in a cast iron skillet. I'm using thin cut bone in pork chops, so these are gonna cook for about 10 to 15 minutes. If you were using a thick cut, you wanna do a little bit longer for about 20 minutes just to make sure that there's no pink inside. All right, now we're gonna finish taking out our pork chops and letting the oil drip off onto a paper towel or something before serving. And then we wanna move our skillet off of the eye, give it time to cool down before we discard the oil. Then when you wash out the pan, just do it with a little bit of water and then a dish towel because the seasonings from this recipe will soak into your pan and it'll be ready to go for whatever you choose to serve the next time. So these are Southern Fried Pork Chops. I'm Caressa Jackson for Heart of the Home. Come and get it. Recipes from the Heart of the Home can be found on the Virginia Farm Bureau website at vafarmbureau.org. We all want healthy rivers and streams, but we can't do that without help from Virginia's landowners. Resource Management Plans, or RMPs, are part of a voluntary program that helps farmers get credit for cleaning up our waters. And once you have an RMP, you are exempt from any new water quality requirements for nine years. The Virginia Department of Conservation and Recreation has funds available to help you implement these plans. Contact the department today to learn more. Thank you. This message sponsored by Virginia's Agriculture Community. Looking for these? You drive buzzed, it could be one very expensive ride. First, you gotta make bail. Then pay me to get your car back. Your insurance premiums will go through the roof. And my legal fees just keep adding up. All told, it could end up costing you $10,000. Buzzed, busted, and broke. Because buzz driving is drunk driving. There's all sorts of fish farming in Virginia known as aquaculture. As Dave Miller reports, the state's oyster harvest is on the rebound thanks to new oyster growers. Virginia's oyster harvest rose 25% last year, passing the 500,000 bushel mark. That means the country's largest oyster producing body of water, the Chesapeake Bay, is back in business. The dockside value for this harvest increased from $16.2 million in 2012 to $22.2 million in 2014, with an estimated economic impact of more than $58 million. This momentum is having a positive impact for the Bay, for consumers, and for the economy. But it's not just wild oysters anymore. In Virginia, I think it's 200 and some licensed growers today not all are active, but there are people in it that are growing millions and millions and millions of oysters a year, which, like I said, it, it's a win-win for our labor force, for the shuckers, for the packers, for the hash shell business, which has gotten to be a big business, has come back today in, in restaurants, and uh, for the environment, being filter feeders, they help clean and filter the bay, and our waters are getting better and, and, and cleaner. There's oysters available year-round that are good, they're fat, it's just not the months with the R in it, the old myth and saying. We've got better inspection programs today 
and the rules and regulations, the way it's monitored, time and temperature control, they are safe to eat in the summertime also. So continue to look and use and eat Virginia oysters year-round. Virginia's oyster harvest is a combination of oysters caught in the wild on public and private oyster grounds and those grown in cages, bags, and floats by aquaculture. According to A.J. Erskine, it's about a 50-50 mix, with both types equally important. The wild harvest is extremely important. Uh, the watermen, the shucker packers, um, the natural strike that happens in, for example, the Great Wacomico or the James River, a lot of seed is moved out of that river. Those are very important programs, and they need to continue. However, the uh, complementary program is aquaculture and the development of hatcheries, uh, and where we put single seed oysters in cages, for example, or we strike oysters um, larvae from our hatcheries on shells and recycle those shells with what we call spat on shells, juvenile oysters struck on those shells out in the bay in these tributaries. So all of those combinations provide a multi-pronged approach to a recovery or a healthier oyster industry. After years of higher expenses and lower harvest, the number of Virginia watermen is down. But the return of the oyster has offered current watermen a viable option and new watermen a way to enter the seafood trade. During the 2012-13 season, almost 409,000 bushels of oysters were harvested. And in the 2013 to 14 season, that number increased to more than 504,000 bushels. That's the largest harvest since 1987. A lot of the watermen have diversified and gone into growing oysters. And some of your oyster producers and packers have gotten into it who had their own private grounds that did single or spat on shell. They've gotten into it because of that one factor of disease and predators. And this is a way to protect that crop and know that they have something for the future to harvest. And they grow fast. In a year, year and a half, two years, they have an oyster that's ready for the marketplace to whereas a natural wild strike oyster generally takes three years. Market size is approximately three inches for oysters in the shell. The workers at chucking houses arrive as early as one o'clock in the morning and are often done packing by mid-morning with their product packaged and ready to be shipped. The shuckers grade the meats and place them in separate stainless steel buckets. The shucked oysters are designated by size according to numbers per gallon. We can't mechanize shucking oysters because the irregularity of the shape of the oyster, you can't put it down a belt and have a knife go in it and cut it. It has to be done by hand. Um, but the flip side of that is that there's a lot of care taken with the product. Um, our shuckers that are local uh, have been here for 30, 40 years. Um, and that's a relationship that grows over time, that develops and you become part of the family. And that's what these small businesses are, these shucker and packer and, and processing facilities, they're families. The new technologies and disease resistant strains of oysters have brought back an industry that had all but disappeared. The bay's water quality has become more important than ever and has made tremendous improvements. The successful growth of Virginia's oyster harvest is the result of a lot of people working toward a common goal, to produce the safest and best tasting oyster available anywhere. From Northumberland County, Virginia, this is Dave Miller reporting. That's going to do it for this edition of Real Virginia. We're so glad you could join us to celebrate the bounty Virginia has to offer, whether it's in your home, your garden, or your landscape, or perhaps our rivers. We're proud to say that this is Real Virginia. So for everyone from the Virginia Farm Bureau, thanks for watching and make it a good week. Chesapeake Bay.